Hey, good morning, everybody. Well, it is officially 11 o'clock, and so we're going to go ahead and get this thing started off. It's really exciting to see all of you here. This is our fourth April Tuesday topic, and so we've had a fun trip all around the state from west to middle, and Melody's coming to us this time from East Tennessee, and we are going to be visiting some about herbs and um and what we also now i haven't um gotten all the schedule um completely shared yet but we're going to be continuing some of these tuesday topics now not every single week because we've been um we've had both tuesday and friday sessions for our master gardeners and uh, for for gardeners across the state so we're not going to quite be able to keep up that pace but we're going to have specific sessions for master gardeners and some of these horticulture hot topics that you know get us out in the field as we can continue through may and june and july so i'll be sharing all of that information via email actually i'll probably send it out when i send out the recap from this presentation so it's been so much fun so far and we are looking forward to more um fun sessions on horticulture this summer so um to start us off uh, today, we are specifically talking about herbs, and I don't know, Melody's kind of already said hello. You want to say a welcome while we get rolling here, Melody? Uh, good morning, folks. I'm real excited to be here with y'all today. Um, some of you that know me know that herbs are one of my favorite things to talk about, so you, you all might be in trouble. We could be here for days. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about you guys. I've heard some comments on the sunshine, but I mean, it's kind of dreary outside. So sitting inside and talking about plants is a pretty, um, pretty joyful task. So um, Melody's got a little bit of, uh, of old school Appalachia in her. So you might hear a little bit about that as we, as we go today. So, you know, we talked about weeds, we talked about transplants. Um, we've talked about uh, annuals. And so this is just kind of a fun combination of a whole lot of different aspects of horticulture. So to kind of get us started off, um, I'm going to, I'm going to start. And I think that, um, so for those of you, I hope most of you know me, I guess I always start this and never actually introduce myself. So um, I'm both a extension specialist, but also have the opportunity to work with master gardeners all over the state. And I feel like this topic of herbs is one of the ones that we have a lot of questions about. People are not exactly sure where as extension, where as master gardeners, we kind of fall um, on this, you know, herb spectrum. And we have a lot of great people who work in this area and, and of course, a lot of great information. And, and so I'm kind of want to start as we sort of frame uh, the discussion with where we fit in this whole uh, spectrum. So, um, so when we think about this, and you can go ahead and move to the, um, to the next slide. When we think about this idea of horticulture and herbs and history, there are um, a lot of horticulturists who actually do research and work in the areas of understanding how health and society and economy have been intertwined. A lot of the plant species that we have are actually you know, in cultivation because they were sought out for spice trade and things like that. So it's an awesome part of horticultural history. And in fact, one of the um, pieces of information that I'm gonna send out with this series, you know, when we send you the video and stuff, is gonna be some historical context from some of our research horticulturists uh, in these areas. So history is important. Um, and also, on the next slide, there's even some ecology and society. Now, we're, we're not going to get in to all of this, um, but if you recognize that picture on the left, that's ginseng, right? And, um, and I got to throw in some, some West Virginia hillbillies just for fun, right? So the ginseng trade and all of the ecology and society and cultural um, some good, some not as good aspects of that even get brought in, right? So horticulture and botany and ecology and society mix. Um, we, we will talk about, in fact, here's one thing I can promise you. We will go through this presentation and Melody will never tell you where her ginseng patch is. Um, so there, you can go ahead to the next one. 
Um, so there are so there are lots of really uh, neat cultural aspects. But when we think about ourselves as horticultural educators and communicators and extension and master gardeners, there's a lot of research that takes place in this area. So I promise that I, I'm not going to go uh, too deep into this. These are actually some extracts from some of my research that I did in grad school. And so there's a lot of research that takes place on the secondary metabolites in fruits and vegetables and herbs, uh, both in the field and in the lab. And so, for instance, those um, extracts right there are from lettuce, right? And so I can tell you what the antioxidant capacity was in those different samples of lettuce. But I'm a horticulturist, right? I can't tell you how much of that lettuce you would need to consume to have any health benefits, right? Because when it comes to the clinical side of that, horticulturists always work in conjunction with medical researchers. So we kind of do the plant-based side and then figuring out how it actually impacts humans, you know, we, uh, we turn off to the, to the medical researchers. So um, next slide. But there's also some other really fun horticultural research that takes place in some of these woodland, medicinal, herb types of plants, um, whether it be plant composition, whether it even be production um, possibilities and reality. So we don't really do very much of this at University of Tennessee, but at uh, NC State University, there are actually some faculty members on the mountain uh, crops research station that study woodland crops, right? So if you want to know how cohash performs or golden seal or ginseng, there are actually horticultural researchers that work in those areas so that they can support growers and, and, and help some of these niche crops actually support the economy. So, um, and finally, uh, with that um, perspective on horticultural research and all of these different ways that herbs and plants and human health are intertwined, then this final slide just kind of brings us back to where we sit on this curve as, as master gardeners, right? So even though there's cool research going on in terms of, you know, those types of woodland medicinals, we don't really work with commercial growers, right? So, and actually that's even true for those of us as specialists. If we get those questions from somebody that says, you know what, I want to learn how to grow ginseng on my farm. We say, hey, there's some great folks at NC State that do that. Why don't you, you know, go uh, connect with their information. And we don't teach or comment on modern medicinal uses, right? Because that's ingestion, you know, that falls more in the clinical uh, side of things. Just the same as we don't comment on what um, mushrooms are edible, right? It's just outside of the range of uh, what we do. So we keep it within our mission of horticulture education and within our expertise. So there are lots of master gardeners and hopefully over the course of the summer we may actually get the chance to visit some of these sites where horticultural aspects of herbs and human history come in in the horticultural sites and the gardens that master gardeners manage. So a lot of cool education takes place there. And of course when it comes to the common culinary herbs there's a lot of great horticulture education that uh, that takes place there. So I hope that kind of provides a little bit of clarity about where we sit in extension and with master gardeners. And so with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Melody for the, for the fun part of the presentation. All right. Great intro, Natalie. Thanks for framing today's conversation for us there because um, as you'll notice from this slide, um, all of our herbs basically stem from medicinal uses because all the documentation that we have on record from literally thousands of years ago came from those purposes. So, you know, we're not going to be talking a lot about that today, that particular element, but, you know, we want you to be aware of what those early origins are just for, for reference points. So to get us started, what exactly is an herb? And to keep it kind of simple, uh, the, the any, any part of the foliage, the leaves or the stems, are what we're going to classify as an herb. Uh, sometimes folks want to throw spices into the mix, but that is actually separate. That is going to be the seeds, berry, uh, bark, root, or fruit that we're going to classify as spice. So think about the dill plant, for instance, because the foliage, um, the you know, what we cut up and use in butter or for our culinary use is going to typically be the leaves and the stem. So we call that an herb. But the seeds that we use for pickling, we consider that a spice. So some of our herbs are actually going to be multifaceted. Um, take, for instance, nutmeg and mace. This comes from one tree. Um, basically, uh, 
they are both considered spices though. That's not technically an herb because we're using that, that red in the top corner there. That is that, um, the deep red outer membrane of the seed that you see pictured there below. And um, cilantro would be another one of those that we could use the foliage uh, as an herb and then the seed, which is uh, coriander, we would use that as a spice. So again, we're gonna really put it in rewind and we're going a long way back because herbs have been in existence for about 60,000 years. Uh, we've been accumulating that knowledge for that long, although the first written documentation wasn't until 5,000 years ago from uh, the Sumerians in, in the Mesopotamia region, which is now modern day Iraq. And actually uh, some anthropologists that were working in Northern Iraq actually unearthed a Neanderthal that had uh, gray piscents, yarrow, um, ephedra, henbane, some kind of thistle, and even marshmallow pollen that was discovered on the body, just basically almost as a way of, of preserving that. Um, and then recent studies with um, tooth plaque actually show that there were um, yarrow and chamomile and poplar that were in those teeth. So years and years ago that we can find documentation from herbs being used. So for today's purposes, we are gonna go a little bit deeper. I've tried to list what all we do use herbs for, and there's a, there's a huge list there. But of course, aromatic and scents are gonna be one area. Um, some of these herbs are gonna be used for perfumes. Uh, some are gonna be used for beneficial and companions. I actually saw that in the chat box as y'all were listing your favorite herbs, there were some mention there of using those as companion plants in the garden. Some are gonna use them for crafts, uh, culinary uses, of course. Some are great uses for dye. Of course, the history itself is pretty cool, and then medicinal, ornamental, and pollinator. And oftentimes, they're going to, again, serve more than one of these functions in our landscape. So again, just trying to set the stage for some of the things I'm going to be discussing as we move into the specific plants here in a minute. So just hang, hang with me for a little while. But oftentimes, we hear the word herbal, and we associate that with drinking herbal tea. I saw somebody put that in the chat box a little while ago. And that is absolutely correct to describe it that way. But when we talk about herbals from years ago, that was actually an ancient manual that helped facilitate the identification of these plants that we now know today. And of course they were documented again for those medicinal purposes. And you see there from that little box that even before the Christian era, there were hundreds of medicinal plants that were known in India. And then the Chinese have almost 2000 plants that they have documented for herbal remedies. And then the Greeks also had written accounts. So of course in China, they utilize herbs along with acupuncture and massage, diet and exercise. There's many holistic practices in, in, um, in the United States today that help uh, facilitate some of these things. Of course, India was the birthplace of Ayurveda medicine, which is uh, basically the science of life. And then in Egypt, they utilized herbs in conjunction with magic and prayers and spells and sacrifices. And then we owe the Egyptians for the practice of, of embalming because at that time, they were using fragrant spices upon death to clean the inside of those corpses because they thought that it helped appease the gods of death. So this one practice actually helped lead to world trade, especially with some of those spice routes. So again, when we think about herbs, we, we've really got to think about the influence of herbs. And this is something we could just talk about literally for days, depending on what era in history we wanted to focus on. So I just threw a couple up here to kind of, again, help illustrate just how significant herbs have been since, since the beginning of time. So uh, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, uh, greatly influenced by herbs. Both Darius and Alexander the Great utilized herbs in their personal gardens. Homer actually wrote about herbs in the Iliad and the Odyssey. And then the, uh, the uh, I can't say his name, Theophrastus, blah, 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 the Greek father of botany. Uh, Queen Elizabeth actually helped bring herbs to England and helped grow that during the Elizabethan age. Of course, again, uh, the spice trading routes uh, were greatly influenced by herbs. Benedictine monasteries, uh, those monastic gardens that the monks were actually um, the ones very well respected, uh, thought to heal, uh, folks took the sick and afflicted to those monasteries specifically for those purposes. 
And then the Crusades, uh, Hippocrates, we're going to talk a little bit more about him later, the Ottoman Empire, the Orient, and then Culpeper, one of the first Puritan apothecaries. So lots of influence through the ages uh, with our, our herbs, but probably no more than the Romans. When we really look at some of those historical concepts from those um, Roman garden villas compared to our gardens today here in the New World, you can kind of see how we we brought some of that across the ocean as they come. You can see where that influence really comes from. So all those geometrically precise uh, gardens with the topiaries, the canals and the fountains, the raised beds, garden rooms, potted plants, all of that kind of helped lead today to our specific gardening styles, the kitchen gardens that we had outside our back door, uh, interplanting and raised beds, companion plantings. You hear all of those things mentioned today. And a lot of that was due, again, to some of the marriage of those traditions with the Native Americans to uh, the pilgrims when they first came here. So again, uh, just bear with me here because I'm going to mention some of these folks just to kind of get, get you kind of said again, uh, because it's these individuals that kind of help document um, herbal lore and medicinal uses to, to bring us to where we are today. So Pliny the Elder is probably one of the most notable when it comes to the history of, of herbs. He wrote uh, Naturalist Historia, which means natural history, and it was one of the single works to have survived during the Roman Empire. And um, he actually focused not only on botany, which actually years ago um, herbalist or what we call botanists today were actually termed herbalists back in the day. So he focused on botany, zoology, astronomy, um, all things geology and mineralogy, and he helped bring the understanding for all things natural life, basically to life. Uh, so unfortunately though, this, this um, one document was the only one to survive of his works because he actually died during the eruption of Mount Mount Vesuvius, and a lot of his writings went with him. Uh, but he was also one that helped kind of bridge the gap between horticulture and agriculture. So a lot of the legumes that we use as cover crops, some of those names, he helped contribute to that, as well as crop rotation practices and farm management practices. He was one of the ones, the early uh, ones that was responsible for some of those things. Um, he was also one that helped transcribe from the ancient Greek documents to make it easier you know, for all populations to be under understand what those plants were and to make them more identifiable for everyone. Then John Garrard, you'll hear me mention him a few times when we get to some of the plants. Um, he was born in the 1500s and actually com compiled the first plant manual and it had over a thousand species that he had growing in his own garden. So basically that first plant manual uh, came to be in 1597. Then about, um, you know, I don't know, 25, 30 years later, Nicholas Culpepper, also from England, uh, wrote The Complete Herbal. And this is still in print today. It's never been out of print um, since it was first published. But it's an alphabetical catalog of all the medicinal plants of native England. So if you, if you have the opportunity, there's a link um, in the slideshow when you get it later that you can actually see this. It's, it's pretty cool to, to actually read some of those things from the 1600s. But his basic mission was to put medicine and natural healing back into the hands of the people. So just a few more things before we get started. Uh, you're going to hear me talk about mordant, uh, which is a dye fixative basically. Sometimes you have to utilize um, other chemical elements to, to get that chemical reaction for the dye to take hold. So you'll hear me mention that with some of the plants. And then Benedictine and Chartreuse are two things you'll hear me also mention because we're going to we're going to talk about these French liquors, but these were those medicinal liquors that were created by monks. And actually, I say I've got a picture here on the next slide, but the letters D-O-M, D-O Optima Maximo, means to God most good, most graceful. Um, Benedictine is actually going to be an amber in color because it has a cognac base, and it's infused with 27 different herbs, and it's still produced um, today. And I actually think I have for your reference, it's got a list of all those herbs that are used. Uh, typically Benedictine, again, is going to be enjoyed like any fine cognac after a meal um, and so forth and with desserts and things. You can see there 
right here is the Benedictine. And then the chartreuse is two different kinds. There's a green and a yellow. And again, this is a, a French liquor uh, and it's naturally made. That's why it has the green colors and both use about 130 different herbs. And they're just macerated and steeped in alcohol for about eight hours. So uh, they, they still use these in, in common practice um, and often will sometimes enjoy with, with their coffee. So to kind of get us started, um, just to kind of give you some basic knowledge of why some herbs are so named today, uh, basil became known as the herb of love. So we had several folks that put basil as their as their favorite herb. Um, I, I wish I could see a show of hands as to how many realized that was indeed, you know, considered the herb of love. But the reason for that is because it was said to have grown outside of Christ's tomb after the, the resurrection. And ironically enough, the Greeks did not like basil. Uh, it was the Romans who loved it and actually made it that symbol of love and fertility that we know today. And along those same lines, uh, rosemary, pictured here, um, actually had white flowers initially. And it was said that the Virgin Mary, when she was fleeing Egypt, laid her blue cloak on the rosemary bush and turned the white flowers blue. So it became known as the Rose of Mary, which is now, of course, a native to the Mediterranean region. And just as an FYI, time was thought to have been the straw, um, the straw bed of baby Jesus when he was born. Uh, this plant here uh, is one that is a noxious weed, very toxic. It's called the, the poison hemlock, but there's even documentation way back uh, that show this plant was, was utilized. This is a picture of Socrates, and his scholar Plato actually documented um, his death. He was sentenced to death. He was a bad boy, so they made him um, drink the juice of the poison hemlock. So even years ago, we could see documentation of the bad side of these herbs as well. Um, I tried to blow these up a little bit so you could see this better. This was one I talked about if anybody was on the wildflower um, walk a couple of weeks ago. This is a betony and Anglo-Saxons believe that betony would keep uh, witchcraft at bay because back during that time witches would practice their craft in the cemetery. So that's why you would see an intermingling of betony. Um, and oftentimes you can still see remnants of this in old cemeteries. You can still see that plant growing. And then probably one of the most famous is the witch hazel, um, of course used for dowsing for water. Um, inter interestingly enough, one of the largest populations in the United States for dowsers today is in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, so this was an ancient practice. You can see him right here, dowsing, using the sticks uh, to find water. And witch hazel was uh, the tree that was most often used for that. And we would be remiss if we didn't talk about tussie mussies. Uh, and you can see there, it's just a traditional bouquet of, of flowers. But basically back in the 1400s, flowers were utilized as a love letter. So especially during the Victorian age, this become, um, this become even more of a fascination. It, be it become the secret language of flowers. So each flower basically represented something. So uh, for instance, again, basil represented love. Uh, calendula represented health. If um, maybe somebody passed, you would send ladies mantle, which, which represented comfort. And then yarrow for healing if someone was sick. So every flower, had a corresponding um, feeling associated with. So when you sent a love letter, it would be in the form of flowers and everybody knew what those, the language of the flowers spoke. So uh, this become again, really popular during the Victorian age. Okay, so that's kind of help us set the stage. And I've, I've talked a little bit about basil and rosemary and thyme and some of those. Um, and I call these commonplace her herbs, not to, to offend any of these herbs, because hopefully we are all very familiar with these herbs and we probably utilize these in our gardens and our landscapes. Uh, we're using them for culinary purposes, maybe even in preservation, like with the dill and the garlic, um, maybe even using them for cut flower arrangements or whatever. But hopefully these are some of those herbs that we all 
know and love. So basically today we're going to take it a little step further, maybe go, go from some of the ordinary to the more extraordinary herbs. And maybe some of these you have heard of, um, maybe not. Maybe if you are growing these or have heard of them, maybe it'll hopefully give you a newfound appreciation um, for some of their history and the, and the lore and legends associated with those. So again, when we are gonna talk about some of these in the next few slides, uh, we can go all the way back to before Christ and, and come up through the uh, Middle Ages, the medieval periods, all the way to when the pilgrims came here into our modern, modern day gardens. Uh, but I feel like we have to give um, credit to the Native Americans because they helped bridge the gap between those two worlds, basically. Um, because when the pilgrims landed here, there was only 90 diseases known at that time uh, among the Native Americans. And the colonists, they recognized this. And that's why Native Americans became um, respected healers in all of their communities. Um, they were the ones that knew how to treat illnesses and, and injuries and helped with childbirth and midwifing and, and all of that. So a lot of the traditional remedies that we find in, in Western, um, the Western herbal dispensaries today, we owe to the Native Americans because they were the first ones to introduce that to, to the white people when they came here. So some of those, and you heard Natalie mention, I think, Cohosh a little bit, a little bit ago, um, Echinacea, Golden Seal, all of those were here. Um, we still see those growing in our native woodlands and our forested areas, uh, still utilized today. Um, but it was because of that, again, the, the Indians helped bring some of that knowledge uh, to the colonists during those times. So um, I couldn't really get these arranged in any format, so I went back and put them in alphabetical order because I didn't want to, you know, play favorites with some of these. So uh, I figured we would start out with Angelica. And the cool thing about Angelica is that this is the one herb that its name has never changed throughout centuries. You know, we often have different names for species depending on um, where we live or where we grew up or its origins or the customs associated with it. But Angelica is the one that has always kept its name no matter where it's grown. Um, it's actually associated with the Archangel Gabriel who appeared to the Virgin Mary during Annunciation. And then it's also associated with the Arch, uh, Archangel Michael whose feast day is in May. Um, the flavor actually resembles rhubarb. It's got like a little bit of a licorice flavor and a fragrance. It's actually uh, considered a delicacy in Iceland. So if any of you have traveled there, you may have eaten Angelica because the stems and the roots are eaten raw with butter, kind of like uh, we fix asparagus. Uh, the root is actually used in vermouth and in gin. So if anybody drinks those liqueurs, um, you're drinking a little bit of Angelica with that. And then um, the roots and seeds are used as a flavoring in the Benedictine and chartreuse that I just told you about. So um, it's going to taste pretty similar to anise, and it's been used as a flavoring agent actually in tobacco, the essential oil has. Um, Arkansas Indians used uh, the root to mix with tobacco flavoring. And you can see that flower head there. This doesn't really give it justice, but it's very prolific in the summertime when it actively starts blooming. And some of the ancient lore says if you need to feel angelic, then just take a bath to help calm your nerves and it could help reduce your anger. And the uh, essential oil is still used in shampoos and perfumes, uh, creams, oils, and all that today. And it's often deemed nature's, um, what do you call it, air freshener. And it's also used in herbal pillows. And you can see there from the prolific um, blooms that it can indeed make a striking border plant um, in your garden. The only maybe drawback is that it, it is really tall. It can get very tall um, and it's going to be best grown from seed. If you do sow it from seed, you don't want to cover that seed. You, you need a lot of light for those seeds to germinate. Um, do be careful because when I showed you Socrates a few minutes ago, it does look very similar to, to poison hemlock um, and it has been used as a, a dye for um, dark green if you more than it with, with iron. If anybody has ever heard of the Chinese herb um, Dong Kwai, this is, this is not that plant, but it is a species of Angelica that grows uh, indigenous to China. 
All right, the next one on our tour is gonna be Bee Balm or Minarda. It goes by several, several different names. Um, Oswego or Bergamot. Uh, actually, I'm gonna give you a bunch of those names as we move through here. Uh, but this is a member of the mint family. It is native to North America. It's gonna bring a brilliant splash of color to your landscape because so many of these colors do exist. Uh, it was discovered by the Indians in New, New York in a place called Otsego, hence the name Oswego. Uh, the cool thing about this plant though, during the Boston Tea Party, the Indians taught the settlers how to drink this as a substitute for tea. And then it's also cultivated in Europe, but it's called Melissa or um, Indian nettle because John Bartram took the seeds from here back to Europe to, to propagate. Uh, we also call this plant horse mint, depending on where you grew up in the um, Appalachians. Typically the red is what um, Southern Appalachians call the, call the horse mint. Uh, it does thrive in a variety of soils though, in light conditions, it's not really picky on where it grows. It is gonna cross pollinate though, so when you, when you do plant these, allow some spacing in between your plants. And then if you cut back that first surge of growth after it blooms, it's gonna force a second growth. A lot of people don't realize that you can cut it back to about an inch from the ground and, and force a second bloom. Uh, another name for this is gonna be mountain mint. Um, that's what you see pictured here. It's got that lighter white bloom. Um, it's gonna be also called bergamot because um, it smells like the bergamot oranges from the um, region of Seville. And that was actually used as an ingredient in cologne um, for years ago in perfume. And it's also used in, in, po in potpourri. Uh, many don't think about using this as a culinary herb, but it does um, pair well with any kind of fruit dish and works in tandem with any of the mints because again, it is a member of the mint family. So you can actually use those blossoms to add color to salads and beverages. And then there is a lemon bee balm, but don't confuse that with lemon balm. Those are two different plants, but there is a species of the lemon bee balm. Uh, next up is borage. Uh, the cool thing about this plant is that it has historical ties to invoking courage. Um, it was a favorite among the soldiers during the Celtic Wars. Uh, they actually had a say in um, ego, barago, gaudia, semper ego. And translated, that means borage always brings me courage. So there's documentation of this years and years ago. So it does have a very storied past. And during the Crusades, it was used in infusions before they actually departed for the Holy Land to help give them courage. And then ladies would embroider the pretty star flowers on scarves that they would give their knights before compact or combat because again it helped bring forth courage and you can see the flower there what that looks like and then according to an old wives tale uh, borage sometimes was smuggled into the drink of a prospective husband to give them courage to propose marriage so i'll plant the seed there for some of you ladies and you can see there what the foliage looks like when it's first starting to burst through in the springtime. Uh, the other cool thing about this plant is that all parts of it are edible and it has a crisp cucumber flavor. Um, the flowers again are going to be beautiful additions to any salads or drinks and then if you know salad burn it, which we're going to talk about that a little bit later, it's also similar in flavor. The bad thing about borage is that it's not going to store long term unless you store it in vinegar. Um, but it's also a pretty attractive um, plant in your garden, but it can sprawl out. I think I've got a picture coming up next that shows you that. So some people don't like that sprawliness and it, it can look kind of rough sometimes. Uh, the other cool thing about borage is that you only need one plant to get started because it is an annual, but it reseeds itself very prolifically, which you can see from this picture here. And if you grow strawberries, this is an excellent companion to strawberries and it's also um, an excellent pollinator plant as you can see there from those pictures. And if you have a moonlight garden, if you grow those uh, silver white foliage leaf plants, um, this is one that you can also add to your moonlight garden. All right, next we're gonna talk about calendula. 
um, which is Calendula officinalis, also called pot marigold, which is no relation to the African marigolds that we use in the garden. Um, that is a totally different species. This one here is actually native to the Canary Islands into Northern Africa and Iran. Uh, but the Christians named this pot marigold because it bloomed during the time of festivals that celebrated the Virgin Mary. And the name that they uh, gave, or the, that was given by the Romans is because they saw it bloomed on the first day of Calends, which is the first day of every month. So you would see it in, in bloom basically the first day of every month. So that was, that was why they called it that. Uh, the Romans would actually use this for insect bites and scorpion bites. Uh, they thought that it did possess magic. So women who could not choose between suitors back in the day would actually uh, mix calendula with other herbs that they steeped in honey and they would drink that, and then that night, whoever she was supposed to marry would appear in her dreams. Um, interestingly enough, calendula is considered a vegetable in England, and it's actually grown with spinach. And then if you ever travel to Scandinavia, this is one that you will eat uh, in oatmeal, <coughs> puddings, dumplings, and they um, actually use it in wine too. So the colonists did bring this to America, but it lost its luster, um, except uh, during the Civil War because they actually used this plant to help stop bleeding. So uh, today it's starting to come back because it's used in ointments and in salves. It's often used as a salve base um, for bruises and cuts and sores. It's one, one of those nature's band-aids that uh, you can basically seal out infection with. It's also gonna make a really attractive border plant. It's gonna grow easily from seed. Uh, the key here is that you need fresh seed. You can't store seed from year to year. Um, that's gonna be pretty essential. Um, a hardy plant's gonna survive frost even up until it gets 25 degrees. And so it's gonna last a little bit longer than some of our other plants in the fall. If you harvest the petals, uh, make sure that those petals don't touch one another because if they do, they'll lose their color. So if you're using for any kind of crafting purposes, just be, be gentle with the petals when you pinch them. Uh, so now, as you can see from some of our um, haircuts and everything, where none of us have been to the hair salon in a couple of months, our highlights are starting to fade. But ladies, if you need a cure to highlight your highlights, use a calendula rinse, um, and it'll, it'll help pull out your natural color a little bit better. Another interesting thing about calendula is that it was used to decorate the altars of the Hindu temples in India, and it's still used for that purpose today. Sometimes you might actually hear this referred to as a poor man's saffron. You can kind of see from the inside here why that would be. Um, quality saffron is going to cost about $3,000 for two pounds. And if you eat any kind of curry or paella or risotto dish that has saffron, you know, that can be pretty expensive. Uh, this is what the calendula, poor man saffron, is going to look like versus true saffron. Uh, because true saffron, you know, comes from the crocus plant, you're going to need about a thousand flowers just to produce one ounce of saffron. That's one reason it's so expensive. And you've just got about a week to harvest those flowers. Um, so pretty much now these are commercially produced, but um, if you're a poor man, you can use calendula in place of saffron. All right, so somebody put in there uh, in the chat box that chervil was one of their favorite herbs. So that's really cool. Um, not a lot of folks recognize this herb. Uh, this is a species that's native to Russia. And sometimes you will hear it called sweet Sicily, but that's not completely accurate because the real sweet Sicily is actually myrrh, which is what the wise man brought to, to baby Jesus. But myrrh and parsley are in the same family as chervil. As far as flavor, it's gonna be half parsley, half anise, so it's gonna have a little bit of that licorice flavor. Um, it's still considered tradition today to eat chervil soup on Holy Thursday. And then it's considered a warm herb. Sometimes you will, you will hear that mentioned in herbal folklore, um, but they call it a warm herb because it fills the senses really slowly and with subtlety. 
So it takes a little time to, to feel this. And Pliny and Culpepper both agreed um, on the warmth of this herb even centuries apart. Uh, you can tell there it's got a really pretty fern-like foliage, um, but if you can keep it from bolting, it's gonna help keep this lush green foliage going throughout the season. This is a plant that is actually gonna prefer a little shade. So if you have shade gardens, this is a really good one that you could incorporate there because it's, it's gonna prefer that. Um, it does grow really well too in containers or in pots grown from seed. And then it's very similar to parsley in that there is a um, plain and curly leafed variety. And you can see there how, how it looks once it starts in the, in the pot. Uh, the other thing about uh, chervil is that the entire plant is edible. It does make a really pretty garnish. And interestingly enough, the Romans considered this an essential cooking herb. So you, uh, if you ever have any French cookbooks, uh, you will often see blanched sprigs of chervil as part of those recipes. And if you ever use finis herbs for cooking, that's chervil, parsley, thyme, and tarragon. So this is one of those herbs utilized in that spice mix, or herb mix, excuse me. Uh, the thing about chervil though is that you don't want to cook continuously with this herb. You want to add it toward the end of cooking because otherwise it can turn off bitter. So if it calls for it in a recipe, don't add it from the beginning, wait toward the end to add it. Um, a lot of folks will use this for carrots and cream peas and corn, um, eggs, spinach, and even oysters. And if you um, do wanna preserve this herb, it does really well in butter because it's, it's not gonna dry and keep well. It is considered a cheerful herb and uh, it's going to be used in potpourri and dried bouquets. And if you have the heat cups, eat chervil. All right, next on our list is comfrey. Um, it's been acclaimed a great healer since the, the um, beginning of time. Uh, sometimes you will hear it called nip bones because back in the day they thought that if you had a broken bone, it would actually help um, mend those bones back together. Uh, the Greeks actually used it to stop bleeding and it's still used as a, as a base in a salve today. The difference between calendula and comfrey is that comfrey has the tendency, if you don't clean that wound very good and you put that on there, it can lock infection in because it, it will seal the skin really tight, which is another reason it's called nip bones. Because um, its scientific name um, actually comes from, from the Latin con, um, conferta, which actually means grow together. Um, let's see. Farmers cultivated this fodder as a feedstock, and then leaves were used in soups and stews back in the day. And then it was also used during the potato famine because they thought it was a high protein source that could be replaced uh, during that time. Um, it has been documented that it's a rare source of vitamin B12, but like Natalie said there earlier, it's something we don't attest to the fact of ingesting any of these um, because. Um, well, we don't have a lot of that scientific evidence, but what little we do says you'd have to eat an enormous amount for it to be effective. You can notice there from the blooms, uh, you get a pinkish and maybe even a purplish color, and oftentimes you'll see that on the same plant, which makes it uh, very striking. It's an excellent pollinator plant. It's a, it's a fast-growing perennial. It's going to be it's my first plant to come up in the, in the springtime. Um, it's not in the mint family, but it's gonna act like it the way that it spreads. It's almost invasive. And you can see the many different shoots that are coming up from this one plant. Um, it, it is gonna need a lot of space to grow. So if you're gonna put this in your garden, uh, make sure it, it has its own dedicated location. Uh, you can propagate by seeds or you can divide the roots in the fall and you can take cuttings from this anytime. Uh, again, just be aware once you get it started, it's gonna be really hard to get rid of. Um, but once you get it started, it requires very little maintenance. You can also make a compost tea with the leaves and stems to feed to your garden. Um, here is why it's really hard to get rid of. And of course that root system is, is really, really deep. It's, just pretty ginormous. Um, and it's for that reason, it's considered what we call a minor plant. So those roots can go really, really deep and pull up some of those micronutrients that some of our normal plants can't reach. 
and uh, make them more available for our other plants in the garden. Uh, which even if we're not growing this in the garden, you can continually keep cutting that comfrey back all throughout the season. And you can either make that compost tea I was talking about or just trim it, cut it all the way back because it's just going to keep being a prolific bloomer until frost. But you can cut all of that foliage back and go put on your garden or on your compost pile and it helps speed up the process. Plus, because it's a minor, it's going to be feeding your, your, your soil as well. Ella campaign. Um, this is a, known as a wild sunflower. It's native here to North America. It blooms all the way from Nova Scotia all the way down to the Carolinas. It's considered a very bitter and pungent plant. Uh, the Romans actually use this for indigestion. And there's many fables about the name, the name of this plant. So um, many feel like it was tied directly back to the Helena Troy that she actually ate this plant when Paris um, accosted her. Uh, some other fables say that it sprung from the goddess Helena's um, tears, and then a third legend describes it being named after the island of Helena where uh, some of the better plants grew. As far as Pliny, this was one of his favorite plants. He documented this several times, and it actually survived many conflicts during the Middle Ages, so that's why it earned the name Elfort and Wild Sunflower, Horse Hill and scabwort. And the reason for that is because veterinarians use this because they had the belief that it had the capability to, to heal sheep scab and any kind of horse ailments. Um, it is a gorgeous ornamental, especially if you plant it along with um, daisies and geraniums. You'll often see it planted in natural habitats or along water's edge. Uh, plus it makes a really attractive flower to a dried arrangement. And you can see there again that root system because the Indians also use this one for a vast array of ailments. And then um, the root is actually used as a flavoring for sweets and in candies. And you can see how tall that plant just got some unique foliage to it. Feverfew is a really delicate, pretty flower. It's a member of the daisy family. Um, it's sometimes confused with chamomile. It got its name because they said it helped dry up a fever and it was also used in child, childbirth. And the British still hold this plant in high regard because it um, heals a lot of ailments. It'll grow pretty much anywhere. Think about sidewalk cracks, uh, except that it does need full sunshine to grow. Feverfew, though, is one that, um, as a pollinator, the bees don't really like the smell of feverfew. So if you like the flower, uh, be, be cautious with it. Don't intermix it with some of your other pollinator plants because bees stay away from that. And you can see there where it is just taking up residence in a rock crack. But many, again, consider it a really pretty ornamental. Another active ingredient in feverfew is pyrethrin just FYI, which is a natural insect repellent. So the British actually use it as a moth repellent. And then we have whorehound, and you can see from that delicate silver foliage, again, it's a good moonlight plant. It is a bitter aromatic warming herb. It's got a woodsy fragrance. Uh, the, both the Greeks and the Hebrews love this plant because it was said to, to relieve a multitude of ailments. And of course, today we see whorehound cough drops in abundance and um, they actually thought that it treated a sore throat. Um, if you mix it with fennel it makes a great iced tea or a lemonade and you can still make a old timey cough syrup with a mixture of this and, and honey and of course again it's still used as an old-fashioned candy flavoring. Um, the leaves are furry and they've got like a menthol like taste so sometimes you will see whorehound ale if you're in England um, because they use it in place of hops over there. So it's got a little bit of a more pungent taste than, than what the actual hops do. And it was a ritual bitter herb of Passover because it helped represent the flight of the Jews from Egypt. Um, it, it does grow easily, but it can take over. So be careful with that. Um, if you put it in pots or maybe help contain it, that would be good. Uh, the foliage, when it does grow out, has a tendency to almost get rubbery, so you need to keep it clipped back for the most vigor. 
Uh, next is hyssop. I have no idea what time it is, y'all. Okay. Um, it's it's a, 10 till. We're having fun. Okay. All right. Yeah, I don't have my clock up here. You just tell me to shut up because, yeah, I'm talking way too much. Okay. So hyssop is a uh, holy herb. So you can just take a whiff of this plant and know it belongs in the medicine cabinet because it smells like camphor. Um, and actually in the Bible, it was referred to as what was to heal leprosy. Uh, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I should be whiter than snow. So it does date back to um, several centuries being a cleansing herb because they would strew it around uh, the floors of their kitchens and it would help improve the smell of the kitchens. You can see there just how vigorous it does grow, pretty prolific. Um, Hippocrates really liked this herb. Um, he did use it in his Benedict, or the monks used it in Benedictine and Chartreuse. Um, it was often said that it could cure a black eye and it can be a substitute for cosmary or mint. And it's gonna be easy to grow just like, like the mints. Uh, keeping it clipped will keep it growing. Just remember that if you're growing it for a pollinator plant, um, the bees, of course, love it for, for food. And actually, ancient beekeepers would say, or would plant this next to their beehives because they said it would sweeten the honey. All right, next up is lovage. Um, a lot of folks get this confused with angelica because the foliage looks very similar. Um, it, it is a favorite amongst growers here because it tastes like celery and it's so much easier to grow. So if anybody's tried to grow celery, you know it can be quite cantankerous to do that. So um, if you grow lovage, then you've got, you've got celery. It's a rather large plant, so you gotta be mindful of that if you, if you plant it in your gardens. Uh, Charlemagne actually planted this in his, uh, and Europeans still use this as a folk remedy. It's gotta have a lot of sun though to, uh, to grow. It is going to die back every year, but it's going to return each year even more prolific than the year before. So again, if you're wanting bushier growth, just keep those flower heads pruned off throughout the season. It's also known as love ache because um, it was uh, deemed an aphrodisiac by medieval knights. Uh, they also would put it in their boots because it helped get rid of foot odor and it was nature's first deodorant. And if you have trouble, if you're having trouble right now staying awake, then you could just chew on a little piece of this and it would help keep you awake. And Lovage loves potatoes. So anytime you're making potato salad or any kind of potato dish, Lovage is a nice accompaniment to that. And then you can also mix it in with butter for a nice savory spread to have on sandwiches and stuff throughout the summer. Okay, now, and we're getting close to the end, I promise. So um, rue is one of those plants that has a colorful history. Um, it means, its scientific name means to set free. And Aristotle loved this herb. He documented it several times because it cured indigestion. So another reason uh, was because it was also deemed an anti-magical herb. Um, Pliny believed that it helped with eyesight. The only bad thing is some people, it's kind of like cilantro tastes like uh, dish soap to some people. Some people can have an allergic reaction to this just touching it. So if your skin gets blotchy, uh, kind of red, uh, it's usually that essential oil from rue that could, you could be having an allergic reaction to that. Uh, during the Great Plague of London, um, there was about 7,000 people dying each week with the plague. Uh, but you know, no one knew really what was causing the disease and there was warnings going out all through the country. But rue um, came about because if you've ever heard of the, the ancient story the, uh, about the four thieves oil, which is still in existence today, that's when this came about because this was one of the original um, ingredients for that. So they would mix a gallon of red wine with rue and sage and wormwood and some others and um, they would rob the graves of the rich corpses, basically, by utilizing this and thought that it could be a healer for the plague. It was used as an antidote for poisons. Uh, it was also used to treat epilepsy back in the day during the Middle Ages. Um, the, the, probably the coolest thing about rue is that it was um, 
played a hand in the design of playing cards. It was used as an early model for the suit of clubs. Um, it doesn't often have a place in ornamental gardens just because of some people having that allergic reaction, um, but it does have that striking blue-green foliage and is also considered one of those moonlight plants. Um, if you have figs, you can plant this next to your figs and it really helps um, helps those figs take off, but you don't want to plant it near basil or sage or cabbage because it can, it can stunt the growth of those plants. Uh, salad burnet, you can see here, it kind of looks like chervil, uh, but not in the same family. This is actually in the rose family. And this was the cucumber to your salad 400 years ago, uh, but now you only see this in some of your trendier upscale restaurants. Uh, it was used as an accompaniment to wine, kind of like, uh, Celery is used in Bloody Marys today, but they would actually serve it with wine. Um, Pliny um, often raved about this plant in his writings too, and you can see, well, I've got a picture of the flower head in, in, a, in a minute ago, or here in a minute, sorry. Uh, but this is one of the herbs that the colonists brought with them to use as a tonic. So some of you have heard me in other classes talk about ramps in the springtime. Our early settlers here in the Southern Appalachians use that as that cleansing tonic in the spring. Uh, well, salad burnet also served that same purpose uh, before ramps were discovered. And you can see that pretty flower there, it's very prolific. Uh, you can use the tender leaves and salads because those older leaves are gonna be a little bit bitter. You can actually use the seeds and cheese spreads and in marinades, um, blend it with other um, herbs for zesty flavoring and, and add it to um, coleslaw or yogurt or any of those as a carrier. Uh, this was considered one of nature's first deodorizers, too. All right, savory. There's actually two different kinds of savory. There's a summer savory and a winter savory. Uh, the summer is a summer annual, and it was at one time the strongest uh, cooking herb available to Europeans until the spice um, trade opened up and brought them black pepper. So this is one that we have documentation of being used for over 2,000 years. Um, it's so named because of satir, satiraja, it comes from the Latin for satire, which was half goat and half man. And they said the satires actually are what owned this plant back in the day. Uh, Virgil also mentioned this in his writing and suggested planting this near beehives because of the pleasant scent that it produced. Um, the Saxons just named it savory because it had that pungent, sweet smell. And years ago, they thought that this was a cure for deafness. It is native to the Mediterranean region. It's gonna be really easy to grow from seed or cuttings. It's gonna germinate really quickly. Um, if you plant it like now, as cool weather as we've had, it's gonna take it a little bit longer to germinate. Uh, the winter savory is a little bit shorter lived. So if you do plant winter uh, savory, even though it's a perennial, you're only gonna get about three years of a lifespan on it. And then um, the herbs de Provence, however you say that in French, uh, this is one of those herbs that is used in that um, herb blend. This was not cultivated though until the ninth century by Italians and they used it in green beans and um, lentils and that's still popular today because many people utilize it as a salt uh, substitute. And um, yeah, okay, so next up, if, again, if you were on the um, wildflower walk a few weeks ago, you heard or you saw me show you this out of my garden. And I actually said I didn't know if it flowered because I keep it clipped back with the weed eater and everything, but uh, it does indeed flower. And it's almost like a low maintenance carpet uh, for your landscape. Uh, the neat thing about this is it smells like fresh cut hay with a vanilla scent when you walk by it. So it's very fragrant, still used in perfumes today. Um, medieval churches would actually hang uh, sprigs of this during religious holidays. And then the Elizabethans would make sachets and wreaths and things like that each year to hang up. In Germany, they would actually take the sweet woodruff leaves and flavor their May wine with it and they actually still do that today. It's called May Bowl. And May Days actually date back to the ancient Druids. So they considered when you added 
um, the sweet woodruff to a young wine, it would help improve that harsh flavor of the wine because of that, again, that vanilla hay-like essence. Uh, in herbal folklore, sweet woodruff uh, represents humility because it does grow so low to the ground. And they, um, you can see those whorls, that's how it got its scientific name because it looks like the spokes on a wheel. And Scandinavians use this herb um, as a cordial and still utilize that today. Uh, it adds a little bit of a grassiness flavor to the wine. Um, think Sauvignon Blanc. Um, it's still used today to scent linens and repel insects, and it is considered a classical woodland residence. And then it uh, will yield a tan dye if you more dan it with alum. And it's just really pretty in a natural forest woodland habitat. You can see how low it grows there to the ground. Very attractive border plant. It's also related to um, madder and cleavers uh, and bed straw. And all those were used in the med medieval times um, as a flavoring actually for tobacco. All right, coming up toward the end here is tansy. Um, some people consider this invasive because again, it's one of those that you can start with one plant and the next year you'll have like 5 million. So be very careful with this plant. But some people like uh, the foliage and the yellow burst of flavor that it brings to the garden um, to serve as a pollinator and then just the, that fern-like foliage appearance. Uh, but the reason this herb was so popular was because it was thought to prolong mortal life through its medicinal qualities um, because again of its spring tonic abilities. And uh, Culpepper swore that if you had freckles or acne or any kind of skin rash that you could use tansy lotion and it would help cure that ailment. And you can actually still purchase some of those um, today. Uh, the leaves of this plant are going to be really peppery, really strong and bold. Uh, so some people have actually used this as a substitute for black pepper. Um, Colonial cooks would actually rub their tables to help deter the bugs, so it does have some um, bug repellent properties there as well. Uh, it's also been considered a uh, ant repellent. People would plant these in pots near their door back in the colonial times to keep the ants and the flies at bay. Some people will also call this ant fern just, just for that reason and will take little um, sprigs and put in their cabinets to keep the ants out. Uh, Cosmary is another species in this same family, uh, but it was used as a Bible bookmark, and that's why Cosmary is referred to as Bible leaf today. So sometimes you'll hear that name used interchangeably. And then um, in mulling cider, sometimes they will utilize tansy leaves, but of course they'll remove those before they serve. And interestingly enough, back in the 16th and 17th century, um, that Holmes knew the smell of this herb because it was again one of those strewing herbs that they would use to deodorize uh, their homes. Okay, I promise we're getting close to the end all, y'all. So valerian is gonna come from the Latin valer, which means to be strong or to be well. So this was actually used as a tincture in World War II to treat shell shock, which is what we know today as PTSD. Um, and the Anglo-Saxons also use it to uh, treat um, shock. So there's an ancient legend here uh, from the Pied Piper of Hamlin. It was said that he used valerian to rid the town of rats. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that legend or not, but it's a good way to intoxicate cats and drive rats away because cats, it's, you would think this was catnip the way that cats react to this. They, they love the smell because it, it does have a distinctive odor. It smells like dirty socks, um, but they'll roll around in valerian, so they love it. It was an ancient treatment for epilepsy, and Germany today actually has many um, propri proprietary drugs that utilize this and some of their medications. So um, diazepam, Valium, uh, those are similar drugs um, as to how this would react, but this plant actually has fewer side, or side effects. Um, in the garden, valerian is going to be one of those old time favorites. Um, you're going to have several cultivars and, and colors available. It's very easy to grow because it does grow wild here in North America. 
Um, they germinate pretty poorly in the springtime, so you gotta wait till the soil warms up before you sow the seed. And you can see there what that root is gonna look like. It's good to help build soil teeth. Tilth. And it's um, also touted again as nature's tranquilizer. Um, some people say that this was, because another name for this is spikenard. So some people say that this is what was referred to in the Bible. It was actually uh, valerian. And la or second to last is vervain. Uh, this is one that's used extensively to, um, whoops, I lost my place there, y'all. Oh, okay. Yeah, this was considered an old companion to the to the human race. Uh, this was very sacred to the Romans. Um, the Latin comes, um, it means sacred boughs, so they would actually hang this from the rafters and things in the, in the churches. Um, the Persians and the Druids would do that pretty uh, respectively during ancient times, and it was thought to heal tumors of the throat. It was also rumored that if you saw a shooting star, you could rub vervain in a handkerchief over a pimple and it would remove it. But you had to do it um, with the handkerchief. You couldn't do it with your bare hands or otherwise you would just transfer the pimple to your hand. So you had to be careful with that. Um, some consider it just a plain Jane plant, but it was considered one of the most magical in Europe and Asia. Uh, it was used to purify those sacred spaces. Um, it was improve immortality. It was utilized for crop uh, fertility, prosperity, and love. So they also thought that it would protect you from lightning and evil forces. And um, the Iroquois, interestingly enough, would take these flowers and mash into a pulp and they said that if you wanted to get rid of obnoxious people, that would do the trick. So anybody that wants to get rid of ob obnoxious people, grove or vein. And then if you uh, drank a tea, they said it would uh, protect you from vampires. So very much one of the most magical plants in, in ancient Europe. Okay, woad is also called um, asp of Jerusalem or glaston. The biggest thing here, because I'm running out of time, um, is it is related, it's in the brassica family. It looks a lot like wild mustard, um, but it is a beautiful blue dye. So it's gonna be a really attractive plant to your garden. Um, but this was what was used as blue dye before indigo. So just an FYI, it's got some pretty uh, magical properties just from that vantage point. Woad uh, would yield the blue dye, weld would uh, yield yellow dye, and then matter would yield red dye. And that was what was used back in the ancient days uh, to dye textiles. Uh, last one we're gonna talk about is wormwood, which is artemisia also considered one of those um, moonlight plants. There's about 400 species of this plant that, that do exist. It was named after Artemis, uh, but this is where the um, ancient liquor absinthe come from. Probably a lot of you know that. Uh, France actually banned this in 1915 because it literally made people pretty, pretty crazy. Uh, but a lot of liquor still utilize uh, this as a flavoring agent because it's used in uh, vermouth and Campari. This is one that's never used in cooking, uh, but it was used as a worming medicine. Veterinarians loved it for animals, and then it was also used for worming people. Uh, but there's some pretty early uh, historical documents that date back to 1600 BC for the use of this plant. And it was actually said that um, according to legend, wormwood is what grew up the trail as the serpent slithered out of the Garden of Eden. And then Mexican women wear wormwood garlands um, when they celebrate the goddess of salt. It is recognized as a pretty effective insect repellent. If any of you have smelled this plant, it is very distinctive. Uh, it's one of those plants that's gonna grow really well in poor soil too. Uh, but it's not a good companion in the garden, again, because of those absent properties, which can be toxic to other plants. So think black walnut and tomatoes. It's gonna have kind of similar effects. Okay, I'm just gonna finish up here. I've got just a few slides. You'll have these for reference, but I tried to go through and list some herbs that actually are stimulants, herbs that are soothers, ones that are more fragrant. And then I also added some additional notable herbs. If you study some of these plants, you can, you can find out where their place in history 
uh, truly was. And then just to kind of finish up with what Natalie started us out with, uh, the phytochemistry of plants, the, the study of those chemicals in plants is pretty cool. And these are all terms that we've heard with plants. So you can see just how much plants really do offer uh, the modern world and, and how far we have evolved and how much that herbs truly have influenced um, modern day herbalists just like you and me. So I hope you've learned a little bit about uh, some of the historical references. Um, like I said, I could talk for days. Y'all got to cut me off. I sped through that there. <laughs> so there were, there were notes in the chat box that were like, don't make her stop. I'm like, I can't make her stop. No, no one can make her stop. <laughs> Well, I sped through that at the end when y'all told me I had 10 minutes. So when Natalie sends this out, you will get all those notes in there too with some of those uh, lore and legends, some of the things I didn't speak to, or there will also be some references embedded throughout that presentation. So make sure you check them out. And um, I didn't do a lot of the Appalachian folklore because I've, I do that separately. Plus we're going to make everybody come to Bluntville in a couple years for state. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll get oh. in lots of Appalachian. Yeah. Um, I, I actually uh, have a little um, poll here that I hope works uh, to give y'all a little bit of a uh, chance to um, give us some feedback on that. And another thing that I wanted to share, I think that I've actually got my um, screen pulled up. One of the things that I'm going to send with all the information is the fact that um, our friends uh, across the mountain um, have a great plants database. And so many of you who have you know, been around Extension or been master gardeners for a while know that one of our hesitations in sometimes sharing herbs is not having land grant or university backed resources that we can go to for some of these plants. And so there are, um, there's a great resource base here that has a lot of information on all of these, including you know, whether it's edible or whether it's not. So some very uh, useful information and I'm going to, I'm going to send that out. It's a, it's a part of the whole uh, North Carolina plant toolbox, which is actually pretty cool. There's identification, there's way more than herbs there. So we'll send uh, this information out to you as well. I mean, I, I couldn't think of any way to, to end a presentation that Melody gave than by bragging on North Carolina. So, uh, <laughs> so We'll get that um, out to you, and do I think everybody's? Oh yeah, yeah. We've got uh, we've already got over 130 people that have answered the <laughs> the poll question. As you can tell, I got a little bit loopy at the end. There's a little bit of a smart aleck um, response there, but we are we're so glad that y'all have joined in with us on this series and we'll also not the recording. We'll send out the background information and. I'll also send out the information for what's coming up in May. So we are not done. We are going to continue to uh, hang out with y'all over the, the course of the rest of this year. Um, I want to uh, go ahead and let anybody who has any final questions um, put in the, the chat box. Melody, do you have anything else you want to share as we close? I did want to share because just looking at some of the comments, um, I wanted to come to you live again from my garden, but I told Natalie, the only thing I really had up to talk about was the comfrey and the tansy. Um, and just as an FYI, I named my cat Tansy because, you know, it can be an invasive species, but that's a She's whole kind of mean too, yeah. a little bit peppery. <laughs> but what I may do is as my herbs continue to come on up, I think I'll do like a short video and maybe get Natalie to share that with all y'all too. So you can kind of see how they're placed in, in the landscape, especially shade versus sun and some of those things. Yeah, absolutely. We'll get it, we'll get it on YouTube and get it shared with people uh, throughout the season. All right. Well, thank you all very much. And I look forward to, to seeing you and maybe future herb talks down the road. All right. Have a great Tuesday. We'll see y'all soon. I'm going to tell you, when I came in here this morning, it was like icicles hanging from the ceiling. And now I've had my heater on and it's like, whew. Oh yeah, I've got, I've got my heater on. Right now. <laughs>
I noticed, um, even though I went back and did spell check on that, there's still a lot of misspellings. <laughs> In the notes. Like, it's the wrong words, you know, like form and from or add for and, and it's like, geez, really? So I'll clean all that up. I think what's in there um, right now, I'll take that out and I'll go through and like, I'm looking at spices right now and it's spouses. So well, I'll clean it up and get, get all that to you, the video and all that stuff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's good. I mean, we're, we're not under a big time crunch for getting that out. So, so that's no problem. How do you, um, save the polling or does that save automatically um i i don't know i may take like a screenshot of that to be sure okay yeah I, um this was the poll that i had prepared last week and we forgot it oh really Oh yeah, that's right. You did say you had one. Yeah. I don't see anything here to uh, to do anything with that. Hmm. <laughs> we had fifty three percent of people who reported that uh, Zoom sessions are great. They might never leave their house again. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I'm still looking for my unmute. I was wondering what you meant that you were being sarcastic. I didn't see that till you said that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if the poll, when we cut this off, if it'll automatically do like the chat. I don't know. I've never really used the polling feature before. Mm -mm successfully yeah i just wish i could i don't want to hit the poll button down there on the bottom because i'm afraid did you get a picture of that already mm -hmm. okay i'm gonna see what that does hmm. well i don't know i guess we'll see here in a few minutes Okay, well, I'm going to sign off so this thing can start downloading. <laughs> All right, that sounds good. Hey, great job. I mean, you should see the comments. Yeah, they're good. Yeah, did. Oh, I'm glad you said that. I'm going to save those too. I think I missed some of those last week. Don't they, I mean, don't they come with your recording? Um, they do up to a certain point, but I always go in and, and save them because we missed some of those comments from the group discussion. What day was that? Friday? Yeah. We missed some of that and then we, toward the very end. We only got the questions from your group, I think is what happened. Is that what? Okay. Well, I need to research that, figure out how to do that. Well, I, we just need to ask our group leaders to quickly copy and paste probably too. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to sign off. All right. Have a good All afternoon. Right. You too. See ya. All right. Bye. bye.